Hey guys, today on the podcast, I am talking with Dr. Sarah Haig. Dr. Haig is a physical therapist who specializes in spinal health and pelvic health, specializing in both women and men. She is a board certified women's health specialist, um, but again, she also specializes in men's pelvic health. And that is what we are talking about today on the show. Uh, Dr. Sarah and I are discussing all the wonderful things of the pelvic floor and pelvic health for men. I really think you're going to find this show interesting, especially if you're a guy and you have a pelvis. Anyway, super fantastic show with lots of great information about your body. Now, before we go to the show, a word from our sponsor. So we are talking about pelvic health in men, um, but we can also talk about pelvic health in women because we all have pelvises and we all want pelvic health. Did you know that one way to have pelvic health is to have a daily movement routine? Um, moving the way your body was designed is a great way to help keep your pelvic floor healthy. So if you don't have a daily movement routine, head on down to osionline.com and check out the Daily 21s program. It's a simple everyday movement program that you can do that will help you move better and feel better, but it can also have lasting health benefits for your pelvic floor. All right, now back to the show. Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. Are you ready? I am ready. All right. So, Sarah, what you probably don't know is that along with doing podcasts, I have um, a bunch of just movement videos that come out every week. And I've been doing this since maybe 2012, 2013. Okay. So I have a lot of videos. Um, and But out of all the videos I have, like the top in the top five, the two most searched videos are um, like restoring pelvic health. Awesome. And, and what's neat about that, it well, it's totally unexpected for me because like I've, I've got all these things, you know, videos about rolling, crawling, just doing ex- movements and exercises. But like, it's amazing to me that out of the, you know, like the, the one and two videos are put by about pushups and squats and then it's pelvic floor health um, for all the views that, uh, that my channel gets. And I don't know how Google knows this, but I trust Google knows what it's talking about because it's Google. But apparently 80% of the people that view those pelvic health videos are men. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I just think that's pretty neat. Um, and apparently, uh, even looking on your website, I was trying to do a little bit of research. I, you have a, a mentorship program where you put that the men's pelvic health is an underserved area. Um. And and there seems to be a need for it based off of Google and 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 the videos on my channel. So, yeah. tell me about how men's pelvic health is an underserved area. So in in healthcare in general, it's typically the women who are kind of understudied, underserved. So when we think about like cardiovascular health and and other aspects of health, it's usually like science for hundreds of years looked at men. And then kind of like, oh, we'll apply it to the little men called ladies. Um, and and we figured out slowly that that's not really how things work. But I would say in the area of pelvic health, it's kind of been the reverse. It's almost like in healthcare, people have like this laser focus on the pelvis of women, um, probably primarily due to like childbirth, plus the fact it's so mysterious and people don't want to talk about it. So women's health physical therapy has been around for over. I would say over 50 years, there were probably people doing it before that. It's been a specialty for about 15 years now um, in in physical therapy, at least. Um, And only recently did we start to say, hey, there's a lot of people with pelvises and a lot of people who need help. And when I first started training for pelvic health, it was really female focused. Every single person in the class was a female. And I got into treating males because someone's like, "Eh, we have a male with an issue who wants to treat him. And I was like, well, it's just anatomy. And, um, but for whatever reason, it's getting better, but it still persists that um, there's this idea that pelvic health should be done by females, even though there's a lot of um, obvious need for choice in practitioners. Um, There's a lot of females who are pelvic uh, female pelvic floor specialists who um, choose to not treat males for whatever reason. I believe they should have that choice as well. But just for some reason, when it came to male pelvic health, especially in the physical therapy world, it's just taken a long time to get men the, the help they need. If men had pelvic pain, 
it'd be diagnosed as prostatitis and you would take antibiotics and get better or not. And if you were in the or not category, it was, um, it was hard because it was hard to know where to go for help <clears throat> and, um, and get a, a good answer and a, and a good plan to feel better. So what are some, I mean, cause it's, it's easy to imagine like, so women sort of can suffer the traumatic experience of childbirth and you can kind of like, even, you know, if you don't know anything about the pelvis, you can think, yeah, that might be, maybe that can cause some trauma. Um, but what are some issues for men? Like what are, what is, like what would be signs of pelvic floor dysfunction or poor pelvic health? Great question. So I think usually the first thing I teach my patients, but also any other healthcare practitioners who don't want to can be considered pelvic health therapists is that there is, um, there is normal function of the pelvis. And very roughly what that looks like is for your bladder function, we're looking at six to seven <clears throat> voids or urinations a day. If you're under 65, zero to one times a night. If you're over 65, one to two not times a night. Um, you should be able to hold it within reason um, and, and empty it without having to run to the bathroom and without leaking urine. So really in, a, in somebody who has a normal um, physio a neurologically intact nervous system, in urinary incontinence is not normal. Um, it's very common, but not normal. So I'd say if you're leaking urine for any reason um, or having to run to the bathroom or not being able to make it to the bathroom because your bladder just really squeezes, um, those are signs that something's not working well. Um, sexual function. There is a normal range of sexual function. And in men, um, that typically does involve erectile function um, as well as uh, orgasm and or ejaculating. And a lot of times sexual dysfunction kind of gets defined as, you know, when things are not satisfactory. And that's what I would say is definitely if it's not satisfactory to talk to someone, but if you've noticed a change, definitely talk to someone. So um, erectile function depends on blood flow. So if there's not good blood flow, actually there's, um, it's been found that if men have or, uh, develop erectile dysfunction, um, they could be within five years of a major cardiac event. So it's not just wow. You know, it, it, and that's not always the, the main reason. It could be stress. It could be psychological. There could be pelvic floor dysfunction. But when there's that change in erectile function, it's good to get that checked. Um, and then bowel function. So honestly, keeping your stool in until you want it to come out is normal. Um, having one to three, well, so having one bowel movement every three days to three bowel movements in one day is normal. So I think that's usually an aha moment for people. It's like, whoa. That's a little I bit of variability that. there. Lots of variability. <laughs> and I feel like if we if we know that and we can embrace it and we feel good between those bowel movements and it's not impacting our life, awesome. But you know, some people, they feel bloated and terrible if they don't have two bowel movements a day. But because that might not be what their system wants, but there is a wide range of normal, but you should feel good. Um, you should be able to have a bowel movement and feel like you're done. Um, and then you should be able to not have pain. There's sometimes where pain is a good warning signal that something needs to change. So for example, if you've been say sitting on a bike seat for three hours and your butt feels uncomfortable, it's probably because you need to get off your butt for a minute. But in general, day to day, if you're having pelvic pain, that is also something that would not be considered normal and would benefit from perhaps discussing that with a healthcare provider. So you asked me, when should people come up, get help? It's whenever it's not falling within those normal ranges and it's impacting your life in a negative way. Any of those times, even if it's falling within normal, but it doesn't feel good just ask for help. There's so much help out there. Are there, I don't know how to ask this as much, but are there lifestyle factors or habits that 
lend themselves more towards not having good pelvic health and uh, and or the other way as well, like lifestyle habits that lend themselves towards having good pelvic health. So our pelvic floor, and I, I wish I could use like all sorts of visuals, but I don't have any models with me to even show you, um, is, you know, so our, we have bowel, bladder, and our sexual organs located in our pelvis. But then at the bottom of all of that, we have our pelvic floor, which is a muscle. It's a muscle, a, a group of muscles, just like any other muscle you use to do any other movement. So I would say one thing for pelvic health is to go, there are muscles there that I should be aware of and make sure they're working well. Other muscles, other places, they contract and relax. So our pelvic floors should be able to do the same, both contract and just as importantly, relax. Um, and so usually that's where I'll start with good pelvic health is like, first of all, does anything feel off to you? But also if we're going to start checking things, can you contract your pelvic floor and can you let it go? Um, Cause very often, especially in the female part of the world, people tend to think, it's all about pelvic floor weakness and that's the problem and we need to get you stronger. I would say in my entire patient population, male and females and everyone in between, um, I would say a non-relaxing pelvic floor is something I see much more commonly and that can actually lead to, to a variety of, of issues. Um, so that going back to your original question as to like, so what, what can you do? Honestly, one of the best things you can do is stay active. So not necessarily doing Kegels or, you know, an hour of pelvic floor mindfulness, but really just moving and staying healthy. So what I mean by that is managing stress, making sure you're getting good sleep, making sure you have a good diet, um, moving, just kind of those general, um, actually pillars of lifestyle medicine that just kind of help you be healthy, the pelvic floor very often will follow along. Um, so I know that that's very general. And then again, probably more specific, I would say is if, as long as you can contract your pelvic floor and relax your pelvic floor, you're on a good street with um, the muscle function. For bowel and bladder, bowel goes heavily towards diet. So just having a good diet where you're staying hydrated, you have fiber, the bladder can be a little bit more um, ornery. It um, can respond to things. Um, you know, some people have questions about, you know, I need to run to the bathroom. If you drink a lot of bladder irritants, which are different for everyone, um, that can make your bladder want to empty more urgently. So you might find yourself going more often or having to rush or maybe not quite making it. Um, some of those things are caffeination, um, carbonation, alcohol, um, citrus fruits tends to be a common one that I see. Um, and also like not drinking enough water, which actually ends up concentrating your urine and can be a bit of an irritant. So all of that is to say, that's one thing behaviorally that people might be able to do. It's not necessarily making you unhealthy, but it might be making you uncomfortable. So it's just a matter of taking the time to figure that out and then modifying as needed. So, so you mentioned stress. So you're saying that just stress in general can affect pelvic health or pelvic floor function. Um, I would say as a clinical observation, yes. So when we think about stress, what do people usually like feel or say they feel when they, when they're stressed? Tension. They're not breathing things like this. And the pelvic floor is right there for it. So a lot of times, um, you know, not to make too big of a joke of it, you know, there's people who say like, well, I'm really, you know, I'm really type A, I'm anally retentive. And quite literally, that is what ends up be showing up clinically <laughs> is, yep, that is a pelvic floor that will not relax. Um, so, you know, I think it is just a matter of, um, uh, you know, some, one way to say it is maybe like an upregulation of the nervous system when everything is always in fight or flight, um, could lead to it. Just have it just also, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why that pelvic floor stays tight, but it does tend to correlate, um, with stress in the patients that I've seen over the years. How, how are the pelvic floor and the diaphragm related or breathing in the pelvic floor related? 
Great question. So the pelvic floor and the diaphragm and actually the pelvic floor muscles are often referred to as the pelvic diaphragm. So those are the only two muscles that run through our body transversely. And when we inhale, right, our diaphragm descends and so does our pelvic floor a little bit. And as we exhale, things kind of recoil. I don't know if, if I, if contraction is quite right, but they kind of recoil um, cause it really is an attention producing event. I don't think. Um, but yeah, so when we breathe and also you start to feel like how your abdominal muscles might change a little bit. Um, and that's, um, a time where you can see all of that, what a lot of people refer to as their core mm -hmm. is related. And, um, so we end up with a situation where if our pelvic floor is tight, if we start looking around, probably our abs might be a little bit clenched and we're not taking deep breaths. So kind of nothing is moving very much. Um, so, so there is some relation with just normal breathing. Um, but also sometimes we'll use that from an intervention or a stress management or a tension management plan is to like, okay, I want you to relax your stomach. Because relaxing your pelvic floor is hard, especially if you're not really in connection with that. You're like, I'm not doing anything down there. If we're like, okay, can we take a deep breath and just exhale and let it all go? And then inhale and feel your stomach move, feel your ribs move. A lot of times they'll start to be like kind of a global shift in that middle. Um, that's way easier than trying to just relax the pelvic floor. Um, does that kind of answer the question about the relationship? They, they yeah. kind of, um, Julie Weeb has a great, um, a great approach called the, um, like the piston. So kind of like how things move. Um, and it's, it's just a, a great way to access things that are kind of hard um, to isolate because they're actually not meant to be used in isolation. Right. Right. So people without issues get through their entire life, not thinking about their pelvic floor. It's just when we start to get into things not working well or not feeling right that we're like, oh, there might be a pelvic floor problem, but we have to look outside of there as well and see how everything's working together. So, and I'm just like, just pulling off of things you said, but so if a guy is walking around and he's trying to look confident or breathing up in his chest mm -hmm. and also, but also sucking in his belly or trying to keep his abs tight, mm -hmm. So he's teaching himself how to breathe up high and not fully use his diaphragm, but he's also keeping his abs tight. Could he then potentially create his own pelvic floor issue? I would say potentially, um, you know, like uh, there's not a study out there that I'm aware of that would say, yes, that leads to that. Right. Um, what I can say is once we help people change the breathing patterns and let go of the, let go of the abs a little bit, um, the, there's some there's very often changes in that pelvic floor ability to contract and relax. Um, Cause something I didn't mention. So I mentioned the core, you know, when we look at our transverse abdominis um, it is well established that pelvic floor and the transverse abdominis. So that deepest abdominal muscle um, are, I just say they're best friends. They're both postural muscles. You know, when you sit up straight, you're not feeling hopefully tension in any one spot, but obviously muscles are turning on right? Otherwise you'd still be slumped over. So when you get up nice and tall through a variety of things, your, your abdominal muscles are kind of just activating and your pelvic floor is as well. And it's, it's, so it's actually a really beautiful system when everything works well. Um, it's just when, um, we, we overwork or we forget to relax. Like I said, I've seen that. I feel like I've seen that more in my career is that there's this need for holding if it's to hold in your stomach so you look thinner if it's holding your pelvic floor because you have to get through that one more meeting before you're allowed to go to the bathroom there's a lot of different reasons why we're holding um it's that let go that can be so powerful so you mentioned um pain can be a symptom of pelvic floor uh issues is it is it one type of pain or different types of pain, or is it referred pain? Is it like, how can, cause pain can be tricky. And 
pain is tricky. And, um, and also usually, like I say, um, tell my students, like it's usually t- trying to tell us something. Um, even if it's not what we think it is. So it can present in a variety of ways. So like scrotal pain, penile pain, um, just perineal pain. So kind of with my patients, I'll call it like the undercarriage pain, right? So kind of that perineal area, rectal pain, um, pain with erection, pain with orgasm, pain post-orgasm. Those are all um, different. They might present all differently. But when we really, can I say, when we really rule out anything else that may be going on, say like a urinary tract infection, um, any other sort of recent injury that you would be aware of, um, then we start looking at what else might not be working well. So the first place we like to look is one, how's the pelvic floor working? So figuring out, is it contracting and relaxing? And then looking around at um, what kind of nerves might be irritated? So in that region of the pelvis, the pudendal nerve innervates a lot, including the pelvic floor, but then also it branches off and um, innervates the penis and the scrotum. There's like just a lot of um, innervation coming down from um, the lumbosacral plexus. So when we're looking at this onset, kind of insidious onset, right? So no injury per se, um, no huge event, just kind of developed out of nowhere, or I would say post-orgasm or some post-bowel movement, something in the pelvis. Want to look what might be irritated, but then also not forget where those nerves are coming from. Um, Because sometimes it is referred from an issue further up in the spine. Wow. Any, well, I know, I'm guessing if, if, if a guy is feeling like something's just not right, he, he should probably go see a specialist, get it checked out. Yes. So um, definitely if there is any concerns or things we call like red flags, so like sudden onset of like acute pain, um, any sort of fever, the, the pain that doesn't change. So, right. So it's kind of like unrelenting um, changes in your bowel or bladder function or sexual function. Go get checked just to make sure that there aren't, um, you know, that there isn't something very serious going on. Um, but also I say mostly to rule out anything serious because the, the, um, I said like the probability of it being something super serious isn't high, but you do want to rule it out, but then also to check for those other things like cardiovascular health, um, you know, is diabetes an issue, other um, call more chronic issues or whole body issues. But I always tell people, if you go to the doctor and it's, and you're, you're okay, meaning there's no infection, there's, they didn't find any red flags, um, and pain and function are your two primary issues. I encourage them to find a pelvic floor therapist, um, physical therapist. The reason being is that if you have an infection, there's medication for that and you should take it. If there's something, heaven forbid, like a tumor or some sort of lesion that needs to be addressed, by all means, go that route. But um, I'll use prostatitis as an issue, sorry, as an example. So prostatitis, um, I mentioned that usually if men have pelvic pain, that's kind of what they get assigned, even if their prostate isn't tender, (laughs) even if um, there isn't, any infection found very often the first line, um, even though that's not in the guidelines is to do a round of antibiotics. And so then you'll have someone who has pain, we're attributing it to the prostate, possible infection, they'll do antibiotics and they don't get better. So now as time goes by, they're still having pain. And obviously the antibiotics didn't address it. So then they might do another round of antibiotics. Now they're still hurting and getting really good at hurting. And as they try to address it medically. So, um, you know, again, I try to encourage patients because they are honestly their best own advocates. Um, Doctors will listen to them much uh, more readily typically than another practitioner who um, may or may not be actively involved in the patient's care. But um, if, if there's nothing serious medically happening, and again, pain and function are two of those main problems, 
find a good pelvic floor therapist who has a good understanding of pain. And you can actually do both things at once. You can have pelvic floor therapy when you're on antibiotics. Um, you know, you can, you know, if you're having more imaging and more testing, if there's no huge contraindications, and I honestly can't think of any right now at the top of my head, um, there's no reason to not start something like physical therapy um, to see can, you know, is the pelvic floor, can we rule out the pelvic floor? Is it contracting and relaxing? Well, are there any areas that are um, numb or tingly and we can identify where the nerve issue may be? So there's a lot of things we can do. Um, even if there's a medical diagnosis being pursued. Um, but again, that's when the big things have been cleared out and really pain and function are the issues. Sorry, All that right. was like talking. No, that was great. Um, so, but I'm listening to you, you've mentioned one thing three times and I, I'm just guessing that there's probably going to be people, okay, well, how do I know if I'm contracting and relaxing well? Great question. Since this discussion is focusing on male pelvic floors, um, it, you guys actually have some, some benefits compared to females. So when you contract your pelvic floor, there are some things that you should feel and there are some things that you shouldn't feel. So things you shouldn't feel um, are your glutes squeezing together. So I even, you know, in the time of COVID, I do a lot of telehealth. If someone did a pelvic floor contraction and they got taller, that was probably not just their pelvic floor. So you shouldn't see your legs move at all. Your glutes shouldn't contract very much at all. Um, your abdominal muscles should not contract. And I put a little asterisk after that because we already talked a little bit about how if you do a good pelvic floor contraction, you might feel that like tensioning in your transverse abdominis because they work together. And that so that's OK. What I tell people is I shouldn't see it happen, though. So you can feel it. But if I see it and it looks like you're getting punched in the stomach. That's not a pelvic floor contraction. And then finally, you should be breathing. So if, if I see like the shoulders or the face kind of stop, um, moving, if your breath changes, if your voice changes, you should be able to talk and look perfectly normal while doing a pelvic floor contraction. So if you start to look weird, <laughs> then you're probably not doing it right. How to tell if you are doing it right. So if you feel any of those things, take a step back and really focus on what you should be feeling. So the pelvic floor muscles, the group of muscles, run from your pubic bone to your sits bones back to your tailbone, right? So it's basically what would be touching on a bicycle seat. And so when you do a pelvic floor contraction, that's what you should feel move. And so usually I'll have people go do it what you think is a Kegel. So there'd be an, you know, a moment of exercise. And then I would ask them what they felt. And if they say, I felt, um, my scrotum move a little bit, that's the right, the right move. The penis should move a little bit. And you will probably also feel your anal sphincters contract and rise in. So that's actually our, the biggest pelvic floor muscle we have is a group called the levator ani elevates the anus. So you should feel those things contract. And I say, great, what did you feel when you stopped contracting? You should feel it almost like, um, you know, almost like an EKG. So if it goes up, it should go back down to where it started. So if you're like, well, I definitely felt the up and I'm not really sure what happened on the way down. Then we need to problem solve. Did you lose your contraction or did you not relax yet? And usually we can tell by let's just try one more. So do a contraction and let go. And um, if they still feel like the same size contraction, then your muscle probably did relax, right? Because if you have a muscle, if you contract a muscle and it doesn't let go, you can't contract it as much the next time. Right. Right. So that's kind of my very general way of trying to get it when I'm not feeling it. Um, one of the best cues, especially for men, if they're having urinary leakage, um, especially like if they've had their prostate out um, for prostate cancer is actually drawing in the penis or shortening the penis. And that's kind Which of- a none of them want to do, but. 
I know. <laughs> I know. Um, so it's funny when I first learned that I'm like, there's not a man on earth who's going to do this. But what I, what I do is I try to, I try to use education and motivation because honestly, the men I've worked with who have had urinary incontinence issues, these really truly are the patients where I'm like, I want you to do 30 of these on a day, 30, not 30 times a hundred. Um, because they are highly motivated, very focused. Um, but then we kind of tip the scales. So, but again, that drawing in and I'll have them feel it the different ways. So if everyone's game for a quick, a quick try is if you just sit up, cause that's usually where things work best and you squeeze, like you don't want to pass gas. So if squeeze, take a breath and then let it go and just see how that feels. And then try the, just give me a shot. And I've actually had my female patients, people without penises, try this. Imagine you have a penis, draw it in. And did it feel any different? Oh, yes, I mean. Or, but anyone. Well, yeah, because <laughs> when, yeah. well, when you were talking about it before, like, because I'm like, well, because contract, relax, contract, relax. And I'm like but I, I can contract at this spot. I can contract in this spot. I can get, <laughs> so, so then I was, just, but no, so that was a great, great demonstration, but yes. Yeah, so, because I know I can do the different spots. Yes. <laughs> right. So, and, and it is, and it's really interesting because so then what's the most right way? Um, you know, a lot of times it's, to me, it's about the function and how it feels. So even, so the pelvic floor contraction can even feel, so pick your favorite contraction and do it. And then slouch and really slouch it out and do the exact same contraction, same command, same contraction, and then sit up super tall and really lift your tailbone like you're the happiest puppy out there and do the same contraction. And did you feel anything different between those three? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's some really neat evidence that when we're in more of that anterior pelvic tilt or more of that happy puppy tailbone lifted pose, the front part of our pelvic floor does more. And we'll also probably feel it like our abs in the front are longer in that position. So again, should you walk around exaggerated all the time? No. Like a happy puppy. Like a happy puppy, like, you know, everything in moderation. But if you're say, finding that you leak when you do long runs, I don't know if you've ever tried to do a Kegel when you're running, this is not a good long-term management and it will make you run oddly it's not how it's supposed to work but a lot of times what i'll have people do is run till you start to feel like you leak check in with what you're doing with your whole body and a lot of times just getting taller so not even a super happy puppy just getting taller our pelvis is naturally tilt forward our the front part of our pelvic floor gets a little bit more help from that positioning and the leaking isn't such an issue so now you're and usually like things tend to be is when you use things kind of correctly, they work really well. Usually the breathing gets better. It feels easier. Running feels less effortful, but it's just a little bit of that mindfulness when you start to fatigue, that can be really helpful. Um, so that's where, you know, when it comes to pelvic floor, how strong is strong enough, strong enough to do the things you want without leaking. Um, that's my professional opinion. I'm sure people would love to disagree with me, but, um, you know, do you need to be able to crack walnuts with your pelvic floor? Uh, not unless that's your job. Um, really it's as long as you can do the things you want to do without leaking and without um, having pain. You know, what's really cool is that thousands of people just checked their, <laughs> their <laughs> their pelvic floor. I, I hope so. Um, and if you're not sure, like phone a friend, um, my contact information will be on here and I can um, even give you some resources as far as how to, so how do you find a pelvic floor therapist? Um, it's, it's not as hard as you might think. Um, but also sometimes it is just a couple simple questions. You know, I, hopefully there's thousands of people giving themselves high fives because they're like, that is better than I thought it would be. But for anyone who's listening and is like, I have no idea. I have no idea. I can't tell you how many people I've checked their pelvic floors and they've been fine. So actually just me like going through that, showing them this is correct. Great contraction, great relaxation. Then with that confidence and that knowledge, 
they didn't need me. <laughs> um, it was, you know, I was just there to confirm. Because it is kind of weird if you've never done it before and you're, you know, you're not sure. So because you mentioned it um, and it's fresh on your mind, how can someone find a pelvic health specialist? So or if they want to work with you, how can they do that as well? So with me, if you happen to be in the North Chicago area, um, you can come see me in the clinic. But also, um, so you can go to, let me get the exact ones um, so it's easy. So if you go to APTA.org, um, you can look up, trying to find, they do have a PT finder, but unfortunately the website can be a little bit, um, there's a lot of words, but so if you go to APTA.org, you should be able to find a little menu. And I just found it that says find a PT. And you can find someone who is either board certified and it's so, and I'm glad we're saying this. So it would be board certified in women's health and then sort through those who treat men. Um, so there is a board certification. I will also say that there's a lot of wonderful pelvic health therapists who are not quote unquote certified um, with certificates or board exams. They've just done the work on their own. Um, if they're members of the APTA, you can find them on there. Um, and then there is also the Academy um, of Pelvic Health. This is formerly the section on women's health, but they did change. Um, and I was happy to be part of the start of that conversation. So they did change it to the Academy of Pelvic Health so that we could be more inclusive. Um, because honestly, the way I look at it is everyone has a pelvis. So that website is um, aptapelvichealth.org. They also have a pelvic, um, they have a pelvic health PT finder. Um, but what I do want people to know is that it is um, limited to people who are members of this organization. And unfortunately, only about a third of our profession is a member of our professional organization. So if you are in a spot and you're like, I've checked the list, there's nobody there, um, you can reach out to me because there are some really great um, communities like on Facebook where um, there are people who are just starting practice. There are people who um, just aren't, for whatever reason, a part of our professional organization that um, could possibly, that you could possibly get connected with close to you. There are also a lot of great pelvic health therapists out there, including me, I'd like to consider myself pretty good, um, who do um, online consults. So because of our licensure laws, we couldn't technically do PT. However, I have found over the years um, that it can be very helpful just to talk to someone and get some education. So it's basically like um, a concierge Google, where you can ask your questions, get the latest evidence, get good clinical um, thoughts on the condition of say urinary incontinence or pelvic pain could help encourage you to go to someone close to you. But sometimes again, just getting those questions answered, um, maybe allaying some of the fears um, or just getting that gentle nudge in the direction you want to go um, can be helpful. So again, it wouldn't technically be PT with, um, someone out of state, unless they happen to have a, a license to practice in your state. But there, like I said, there's a lot of good opportunity to um, consult, learn, um, and get some help to be pointed in the right direction. And if they're reaching out directly to you, how? Um, probably the easiest way is I'll, um, if it's okay, I'll just say my, my clinic. So we closed our brick and mortar clinic, but um, Sandy Hilton and I um, have uh, used to have a clinic brick and mortar, mortar called Entropy Physiotherapy and Wellness. So we both still do um, consults through there. So that's just entropy, E-N-T-R-O-P-Y dot physio, P-H-Y-S-I-O. Um, if someone's interested in like working with me directly um, for physical therapy, I would say you could also um, just email me at my entropy website and um or at my entropy email, which is just my name, Sarah at entropy.physio and um, could try to get you connected for telehealth or an in-person visit um, where I'm in clinic now, which is at Rosalind Franklin University. 
Awesome. And I'll put those in the notes of this show as well. Uh, two more questions. Okay. Um, so the number one question I get, no matter from those videos on YouTube, uh, are it always boils down to, can this heal or can this go away? Can I fix this? And I'm always pro the miracle of the body. But since I've got you here, can people heal, repair, restore, and fix or whatever, all the, the things? So here's, I cut you off. What no, else? No, you got it. That was okay. it. Um, so I actually have on my disclaimer slide when I give lectures that I am terribly biased to thinking that people are strong and resilient and we do heal. I would say very often, honestly, outside of childbirth, um, it, it pelvic floor issues, pelvic issues that I have seen are very rarely due to trauma. I do treat people who have neurological issues, which is another kind of bucket, but I don't think that's a primary people who are reaching out to you. Um, the people who are reaching out to you um, who are neurologically intact um, and have not undergone any huge physical trauma recently. Um, and I say it like that because unfortunately, um, adverse childhood events and things like that can play into this. But even in those cases, I don't think you're wrong. I think that people can get better. I have seen people come so far. Um, I will say that it always takes longer than people want it to. Um, there is no magic bullet, but if it's, if it's pain or musculoskeletal dysfunction, I haven't seen any evidence that suggests it cannot get better. Awesome. No, that's what I was hoping that <laughs> you would say. Last question. Do you like peanut butter? I love peanut butter. Awesome. What kind? I prefer crunchy. I'm not super particular on the brand. Right on. <laughs> I didn't just, I asked, I try to ask that to everyone. <laughs> um, I, like, I, really, I know the answer to. <laughs> I really like people that like peanut butter. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Sarah, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. Absolutely. Anytime. If you would like to have Dr. Sarah back on the show to discuss specific issues in men's health, drop us a note, make a comment, or just simply email or send a pigeon.